Growing up in Detroit in the 1970s, there were no improv classes for teens. There were no youth journaling workshops or summer college mini camps on international relations. There were no all ages, gender neutral poetry slams, followed by straight edge raves and iced chai at the local free trade coffee shop. Growing up in Detroit in the 1970s, you had your choice of three different pastimes, sports, drinking and driving, and music. I sucked at sports. I got exceptionally good at drinking and driving. But music, music was salvation. Music was deliverance. Music was what raised us from the hazardous industrial motor city muck and gave our souls their flight instructions. A glimpse of heavenly rapture, a realm where we could realize our infinite potential and the riddle of human existence divulged its master key. Oh, what was my favorite band for accessing the spark of the divine? The Boners. <laughs> Followed by The Pigs, The Sillies, Cold Cock, The Motor City Mutants, and Destroy All Monsters. <laughs> the reruns had aspirations to be a big arena rock band. You could just tell, so fuck them. <laughs> Algebra mothers could have owned that city if their singer could have only mastered his agoraphobia. At age 17, sneaking into bars to listen to punk bands helped life live up to its advertised potential, at least for a little while. The epicenter of Detroit's punk scene was a dive called Bookies Club 870. It was a former piano bar called Frank Gagan's. Over the door was a broken neon profile of Frank himself, across the street from which was uh, what we youngsters in 1978 salaciously thought was Detroit's Gay Strip, which was about two bars long. <laughs> Bookies Club 870 was narrow, dark, and run down, with two rows of tiny vinyl booths on one side and a meager bar on the other. The stage at the far end of the room was about the size of a ping pong table. They also stored their beer cases there. At the other end of the front door was a front door, was a booth on a raised platform under a huge sign that said Pig's Corner. And that's where the uh, undercover cops were expected to sit while they watched for illicit activity. <laughs> there weren't many leather jackets at Bookies Club 870. Back then, leather jackets were the exclusive property of the motorcycle games. And in Detroit back then, uh, motorcycle bikers outnumbered punks by about 17,000 to one. <laughs> there were definitely no mohawks, which is kind of an affectation for posers trying too hard to look British, the kind who are fond of, fond of yelling shite a lot. There were ripped t-shirts, but without safety pins, and filthy jeans and work boots, and if you were in a fancy dress-up kind of mood, leather pants and bondage belts. Lots of miniskirts and makeup and teased hair, lots of gum chewing and smoking at the same time, and a shit ton of experimentation everywhere on everything. My cohorts and I were very aware that the age of Aquarius had passed, and we had all spent it at home arguing with babysitters. <laughs> and our older brothers and sisters were assholes about this. They kept bragging to us how they messed up society shit good and hard. Now there really had been a revolution going on in Detroit at this time. The Black Panther Party, the White Panther Party, Students for a Democratic Society, campus occupations, demonstrations, riots, you know, fun. <laughs> and our brothers and sisters had gotten the soundtracks to go with it. The Motor City Five, better known as the MC Five, Blue Cheer, Frigid Pink, Iggy Pop and the Three Stooges. So as the torch was passed from one generation to the next, condescendingly we told our older siblings in the traditional Detroit manner to go fuck themselves. They'd gotten old and tired and were trying to figure out how to get paid union factory wages without actually having to work in a factory. We youngsters still had MC5's Fred Sonic Smith, who fronted his own outfit, Sonic's Rendezvous Band. The dude who married Patti Smith raised a family in Gross Point, and did benefits for the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. Yeah, how punk is that? <laughs> Nowadays, I'm old and have to watch people's mouths to watch every, everything they're saying. <laughs> and know so little about current music that it appalls me. But at least I wasn't a hippie. <laughs> in college, I tried to maintain the momentum of my musical exploration as best I could. Um, I'd never been the confrontational type, so instead I used persuasion and logic 
not shouting, to spread the considered opinion that my music was superior and yours was dog shit. <laughs> I didn't expect to convert everyone to clash, into Clash fanatics overnight. If I could just get them listening to some power pop like Nick Lowe or Ultravox, I figured it would be a gateway drug. <laughs> but the bars in Ann Arbor were much harder to sneak into, and my consumption of decent music dwindled during the school year. The King Bees just didn't cut it. No King Bees fans out there? Not surprised. <laughs> then the Ramones came to town. Oh God, the Ramones! <laughs> Do you remember where you were the first time you heard a Ramones record? Do you? I certainly do. That's a question like, where were you when the Twin Towers fell? But you know, really good. How in hell did Johnny, Joey, Tommy, and Dee Dee get it all so right? How did they manage to purge rock and roll of every bit of navel gazing and patchouli filigree to get back to the universal pre-psychedelic questions of boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy just want to sniff some glue? <laughs> as close as I could find today. And it's the closest one that would fit at this age. In November, the Ramones came to Dooley's, a typical U of M bar that reeked of tequila sunrises and deodorant. But, so we had to go. Now, if you wanted to survive a Ramones concert, you had to have boots, preferably with steel toes. So I borrowed a pair of boots, found some clothes that could stand the ripping, and joined the mosh pit. The Ramones were exactly what you thought they'd be. It was never, hey Ann Arbor, how y'all doing tonight? Does everyone feel, all right? No, it was a shout of, one, two, three, four! And then a firestorm. And then, one, two, three, four! And then another firestorm. And after 45 minutes of that, you knew you had been done good and hard. A few weeks later, I went to relax with my stereo. I put on my headphones and put something on the turntable. Something with a lot of high frequencies, probably Blondie. I laid, Blondie. I laid myself down on the couch and the music started. And the inside of my ears burned with pain, like hot needles being dug really deep inside. Did I notice? Ah, probably a head cold, if I had only known. A month later, the police came to town, playing at the classy state theater. Even at this early stage, the police managed to be both punk and establishment at the same time. Maybe because their dye jobs were just so perfect. <laughs> I didn't like them much at all, but girls seemed to. So I bought a pair of tickets and invited Lily Yamasaki. Gorgeous, hyper-intelligent Lily Yamasaki with ebony, shiny hair that went through way past her ass. That night, Sting was in love with his reverb, as well as the sound of his own screech, so we spent about 45 queasy minutes walking on the moon with him. It was a tiring night. We tried, to, we tried to have fun and dance in the aisles, but the ushers kept telling us that wasn't allowed. Later, I tried making out with little Yamasaki and was told that wasn't allowed either. <laughs> the last I stalked her on the internet, he was... <laughs> Just me. <laughs> the last I stalked her on the internet, she's a biology professor at Columbia University, oh involved in cancer research, specializing in tumorigenesis. So, you know, her loss. <laughs> in the spring, something new came along, a British band that only the most elite of our snobby musical crowd had ever even heard of. Back in Detroit on the Far East Side, the Motor City Roller Rink, Steve, eight mile. eight mile and Harper. The Motor City Roller Rink was uh, going to host the Jam. Ah. Their mod clothes and perfect haircuts looked a little suspicious, but there was no denying these guys knew what to do. They were also at the time vying for the title of world's loudest band. Their concerts had rumored to top out at 120 decibels. Pain begins at 125 decibels. That's pretty convenient. <laughs> Seeing a show at the Motor City Roller Rink was similar in a creepy way to a junior high sock hop with its green terrazzo lobby and a uh, you know, wooden floor in the arena and the greasy odor of hot dogs and uh, orange drink. The jam came on and ripped through their set. 75 minutes, no encore, no curtain call, barely a pause between songs. But in that short period of time, 
from a band whose songs I couldn't even name, I came away with blurry memories and a permanent souvenir. A high-pitched hissing sound in my head like a cluster of steam radiators and 20% permanent hearing loss. So now I knew I was mortal. <laughs> Did this stop me from chasing punk bands around from bar to bar? The doctor said that more loud noise would cause more loss, so if I couldn't avoid loud noise, I thought I should at least use protection. Well, Orpheus was still on stage at some dive out there, drunk and filthy and incoherent, so it was time for me to go shopping for sound prophylactics. Long before TMI, shopping for the other kind. I perused Michigan's, I perused Michigan's finest gun emporiums to sample the latest in foam rubber earplugs and window shop for those big plastic headphones like the people wear when they direct traffic at the airport. Going out was a new reality for me, the eunuch at the origin. I should just end it there. I go off to a sad trombone sound. Friends at shows would often volunteer to sit with me at the back of the bar, away from the speakers, but that never lasted long. Stepping back from the whole scene uh, gave me some perspective. And you know what I decided? I decided perspective really sucks. I was 19. I wanted to dance, mosh, slam, and push people around. But if I did, I would kiss more here and goodbye forever. And no amount of ignorance or bravado would change that. Then, temptation raised its spiky head one last time. Bookies Club 870 announced they were hosting, for a solid week of shows, homegrown hero Iggy Pop. Oh. The world's forgotten boy himself. The idiot! The, cheat the streetwalking cheetah with a heart full of napalm, the runaway son of a nuclear A-bomb! You know the words. Iggy was getting really old by then. He was 33. <laughs> Who knew if he'd ever perform again? <laughs> I had to go. I had to see Iggy's swan song, even with the danger to my hearing, and even though Iggy was in the middle of his fascination with crooning the great American songbook. It's back in 78, this is what he was doing. If you want to cripple your concept of what should be allowable in the world, <laughs> imagine going to see a shirtless, sweaty, bug-eyed Iggy Pop after 30 minutes of thrashing and throwing himself around, turn to his band and slow them down, repeatedly nag them, slow it down, bring down the temple, man, and break into his rendition of one for my baby and one more for the road. <laughs> A lot of us shouted, fuck you, Iggy! <laughs> Iggy shouted, fuck you back! And kept channeling Frank Sinatra, Jr. <laughs> No one was sure this wasn't a put-out. We all stood around, jammed shoulder to shoulder, wondering if the godfather of punk was having a good laugh at us, singing, I get a kick out of you before I want to be your dog. I was standing right up front, wearing my big red hearing protectors. Oh my God. Like a pale horse. I got some double takes, but people probably thought I worked there. Or at the airport. A friend had an idea that I wished I'd thought of. He said I should have taken a Sharpie and written all over the headphones, music sucks, Iggy sucks, I hate peace and quiet. But I suppose the mess message was still there. Also, there was that queasy feeling of non-commitment, of dishonesty, of only half wanting to be where I was. This wasn't the last bar concert I ever attended, but it was the last one I was maniacally charged up for. Fitting that my last good time was spent with the stooge who started it all, with the godfather of punk. All those nights out at concerts came to an end, and I took up crochet. <laughs> <laughs> but when you think about it, Iggy crooning from the Great American Songbook in 1979 was pretty punk. About as punk as me showing up at the front row, equipped and determined not to hear any of it. Rock on, Iggy. I'll be waiting in the car. Yeah.